So um, before I introduce the first speaker, let me thank Dr. Makopatai, who's here somewhere, I'm told, uh, who has generously offered some support for this. There he is, over there. So thank you for the support of these sessions. Yeah. Andrew Granville uh, at the University of Montreal got his PhD in Queen's University, got promoted to the Royal Society of Canada, won a Chauvenet Prize for Exposition, which is relevant to his talk here, and most recently has authored a book with his sister called Prime Suspects, which I think is a murder mystery having to do with primes and permutations and why they're really the same thing, more or less. Anyway, he's going to talk today about missing digits and good approximation. Andrew. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks for the woos. Um, it's very bright light, so I can't really see you, but I'll trust you're out there. Um, so today's session, um, I'm not sure it's for, the, I think it might be for the first time, the current events bulletin is focusing on the Fields Medalists, and um, I'm starting off with James Maynard. There he is in repose. Um, I'll tell you one nice story about the Fields Medal Ceremony um, and James. Um, I think in around February, um, he, maybe earlier, he, he and his wife discovered they were pregnant with their first baby and they got an exp a due date. Then he found out he was getting the Fields Medal and guess what date that was going to be presented on. <laughs> So that was he, was, he was the first speaker at the uh, ceremony and he rushed to get his plane and the baby was very cooperative, it came the next day. <laughs> um, so I wanna talk about some of his work and um, let me just mention some of the things, I'll mention all the things that, that um, came up in his Fields Medal, uh, Lord Etio. So in 2013, um, an unknown mathematician called Yutang Zhang prove that there are bounded gaps between primes, a rather shocking result. Um, I'm an expert in that kind of thing and really didn't see that coming. Um, an extraordinary piece of work from uh, Zhang. Uh, he wrote this paper that you know, every line was beautifully written, very easy to follow. Um, difficult work, very difficult mathematics, but very clearly proved the theorem he claimed. It was just hard to believe somebody you'd never heard of had proved this great theorem, but, but he had. Um, and I talked about this at uh, the Current Events Bulletin in 2014. Um, a few months after Yutang Zhang um, announced his result, um, James Maynard got his PhD at Oxford, and um, he was working on fairly technical questions about uh, sieves, small sieves, as they're called in the trade. And... Um, he, you know, there is a psychological change that once the theorem's proved, you think, huh, it's provable. And maybe nobody had thought that before. So James was convinced he could give a much easier proof than Zhang. Um, I, for one, told him you're never going to do it, but he didn't listen, thankfully. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he came up with this relatively simple proof. And when I say relatively simple, I would guess that half of the master's theses in the world in analytic number three this year uh, working out James's paper. So it's at the level you can write your master's thesis on it once you understand it. So, um, oh, I guess this is meant to be a bit of a gossipy session. That's true, right? So um, you've probably heard that Yutang Zhang has claimed to prove um, no Siegel zeros, which is if, I mean, there's many ways to describe it informally, but I should say a very weak form of the Riemann hypothesis for, for uh, a generalization of the Riemann zeta function. Um, this manuscript isn't quite as clean as his 2013 manuscript, and there are some small mistakes. As far as I know, they're fixable, um, but the jury's out on whether this is proved. But um, he has an amazing track record, so wouldn't put anything past him. And anyway, at about the same time, um, Terry Tao, um, who knows no fear, just came along and gave his own proof of the same theorem, which he actually didn't publish in a paper, it published it on his blog. So actually, very nicely, he, he felt he didn't want to steal any thunder from Maynard, so he let Maynard have the big publication. He said, I've given another proof a bit like Maynard's on his blog. So yeah, so that was what he did just after his PhD. 
And then um, let me tell you about another question that he worked on. So this is Cramier's conjecture. This is the Cramier famous to people in, in uh, statistics. He, if, you, if you're a statistician, you may not know he did his PhD on analytic number theory, but he kind of introduced statistical methods into analytic number theory in his PhD and just afterwards. And so we're gonna let, well, throughout this talk, P1 equals two, P2 equals three, be the sequence of consecutive primes. And the prime number theorem says there are x over log x primes up to x, so the average spacing is about log x, right, which is why getting a bounded spacing is amazing. But how big can spacings get? And Cramier um, conjectured that it should be bigger than log squared x. Um, and, oh, I should tell you, this, this picture of him is a drawing that comes from the Insurance Hall of Fame. <laughs> so I think, David, you, you started the AMS Fellows Program. I think we should have hand drawings of all of the AMS Fellows on the AMS website, just like the Insurance Hall of Fame. But anyway, that's the subject for another day. So um, when I was a young mathematician, this was um, perhaps the result I most wanted to prove. So here's a result, I call it the Erdos Rankin theorem. There's a sequence of papers between 1938 and 1963 by Rankin and Erdos, where they proved that they couldn't get log squared x, but they could do better than the average gap of log x, and they could beat it by these functions, which they're known as the drowning analytic number theorists function, log, 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 log. And um, the thing to notice is, um, well, so, the, all these theorems from 1938 to 1963 improve the constant C. So my burning ambition was to do better than just improving a little bit, but make it go to infinity. Couldn't do it. Um, Erd, this is actually Erdos. I don't know, you know, the law of Erdos may be a bit dim by now. It's been a long time since he passed. But for problems that he desperately wanted to do but couldn't, he used to offer financial prizes. And um, he offered $10,000 for this. It was his biggest prize. And let me just say, when I was a postdoc in 1988, I think my salary was 23,000. So $10,000 is a lot of money back then. Um, so it wasn't just financially reasons I wanted to prove this conjecture, but couldn't. Anyway, this had stood open for a very long time. And then um, in the second half of his first year past PhD, um, Maynard improved this, see so going to infinity. And what I want you to do is to stare at log x, log, log x, log, log, log x over, particularly the triple log x squared on the bottom. And I'm gonna show you the new result. The triple log x squared has become a single triple log x. <laughs> That's an improvement, by the way. So, okay, I mean, technically this is wonderful. I mean, the ideas in it are wonderful. And, and there are two sets of ideas. There's Ford, Green, Carniagan, and Tau had one type of idea and Maynard had rather different, and eventually they brought their ideas together and got this better result. Maynard's was just, it made, made you want to cry, it was so beautiful. I mean, he managed to turn around his bounded gaps between prime sieve and make it a big gaps between prime sieve in a way that i would certainly never seen before. I was quite stunned by. So, um, in the years since then, he's proved quite a lot of theorems, and I want to focus on two, but I'll actually say one further one. So basically, we're going to be interested for now in identifying primes of a natural set of integers. So perhaps amongst all the integers, as I said, the density is about one over log for the number of primes up to x, or in an arithmetic progression, so one mod three, say. Those are questions that have been done. You can also ask more difficult questions, like if I have a natural set of integers, a prime plus two, can I find infinitely many primes in that set? That's the twin prime conjecture in the in disguise. That's open or infinitely many n squared plus one, that's also open. I mean, when I say open, I mean very, very open. I mean, no, no ideas to prove it as far as I know. You can obviously ask, I mean, just because you don't know whether you can prove infinitely many primes, you can still speculate how many primes there are. So Gauss had, um, actually when he was 15 year old, had looked at tables of primes and noticed, by looking at tables of primes up to three million, or computing in some intervals, that roughly one in log x integers near x are prime. And um, so that's where we get this proportion one in log x. And uh, that implies what's called the prime number theorem. Pi of x, we'll use that notation. Number of primes up to x should, is about x over log x. And for an arbitrary set, you can sort of guess the same thing. For an arbitrary sensible arithmetic set. 
But you do have to take a, it's not quite correct. So if I was asking you for the primes congruent to one mod three, I mean, there's no primes congruent to zero mod three, right? So you wouldn't expect a third of a prime to be in one mod three, you expect half a prime. So I, I sort of outline there how you take account of that. But up to taking account of small primes, we basically believe this in any sensible set. So just to kind of give you a setting. To, so it should be about the number of integers in the set divided by log x and then some arithmetic factor. So what's really hard is to find primes in a very sparse set of integers. And I'm just gonna run you through three famous theorems. So one is not the primes up to x, but the primes in a short interval near to x. And so you might say between x and x to the 0.99, and this is actually a theorem from about 80 years ago by Hoheisel that this can be done. We can count the number of primes in there, but it's very non-trivial. You could ask an arithmetic progression, mod q, like one mod q, and look up to q to the 100. And that's roughly the, sort of the same type of question in terms of number of uh, elements in that sequence. Or here's one that, that will come in later in arithmetic uh, uh, Diophantine approximation, is you take like alpha equals, I don't know, e, and you do e times n, and you look at it mod one. In other words, I'm just taking the real number and taking the fractional part. And I'm asking, how often is that fractional part very, very, very close to zero? And in all these things, and that was, uh, so sorry, the second one was done by Linux, the third one by Vinogradov, all of them about 80 years ago. So these are done and long gone. Um, all of these sets have about size x to the 0.99, but there's actually very few other sparse sets that we've had much success on ever since. Now what I should say in all of these questions, there's, there's no sort of plan for beating x to the half. In the first two, even with the Riemann hypothesis or the generalized Riemann hypothesis, you wouldn't be able to go below x and a half in the length of your interval. And we certainly believe much shorter intervals or much shorter arithmetic progression should have a bunch of primes. So these are tough questions. So I brought up m squared plus one on the previous slide. Um, that we can't do, that's x to the half integers up to x. But here's a couple of things we can do. So um, if you look at the polynomial in two variables, c squared plus d to the four, that has about x to three quarters integers up to x. And that about 23 years ago, I think, uh, Evanietz and Friedlander proved that has infinitely many primes. Um, and then soon afterwards, a cubed plus two b cubed, and that has about x to the two thirds integers up to x, and that has an interesting structure. a cubed plus two b cubed is uh, part of what we call a norm form, so if you take the norm of this, so by norm I'm just meaning multiply by the conjugates replace two to the one third by the other cube roots of two, then that product is a cubed plus two b cubed plus four c cubed. Actually, that's the easy, to, relatively easy to show that has as many primes as you expect, but taking c equals zero is very hard. So in 2002, Heath, Brown, and Moraz proved such a result for any irreducible cubic norm, um, norm form, as long as when you put the variable equal to zero, you've got something that's still irreducible. So that was kind of where the subject's been more or less stuck, though, with some little advances ever since. And then a few years ago, Maynard kind of went crazy on this, and he showed you could do this in a very, very general class of number fields. So he's got a very general class of norm forms with variables set to zero, size about x to the three quarters, where you get prime values. Okay, so. I want to talk about primes in a sparse set, and now I'll finally move on to the topic of my talk. Well, there's two topics. So I tried to put up, make a suggestive poster. So the first one is on primes of restricted digits. So what you notice about um, the uh, numbers up there is, well, you notice they've only got one, four, and three in them. You may not know they're all prime, but they are. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of them, eh? just with the three digits, one, three, and four, four digits long. So you might think, huh, are you gonna get lots of primes that have just got um, those three digits? Infinitely many, maybe? Well, if you think about it, this is an exceptionally sparse set because at each digit, I'm just allowing three possibilities, right? So the number of possibilities for four digits is three times three times three times three, 81 possibilities, and you can see nine of them are prime. Um, so three to the k is, when you've got k digits, there's 10 to the k integers up to 10 to the k. 
So the number there is less than x to the half, right? It's x to the log 3 over log 10. So I'm saying this is way beyond our technology today. But it's a good question for somebody in this room to do eventually. Um, surprise us all. But what I want to tell you about, well, I want to discuss this question. I want to tell you about the advance Maynard made on this, a spectacular advance. So let's just start with base 2. The only possible digits are 0, 1. But you know, if you're into just missing a 1, it's just 0. So that's not very interesting. So we'd just be missing zeros. And then you've got the integers 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 in base 2. Those are the mesend numbers, 2 to the something minus 1. And it's a conjecture going back to the 17th century. There are infinitely many such primes. If there are, there are infinitely many even perfect numbers. But it's an open question. James didn't do anything on that. So we're going to work in bases bigger than 2. And we'll just have some set of digits which are allowed. So for instance, d is 1, 3, and 4 in base 10. So just following from before, the number of integers in that set is about x to the some power. So it's always x to a power less than 1 in these sets. So that's a sparse set as far as I'm concerned. And I looked, I just calculated what's closest to 0.99. So if you're in base 29 and allowed 28 digits, that would be x to the 0.99. So um, maybe I'll just state Maynard's theorem is, amongst other things, and I'll, I'll more talk about other things here, he proved that in base 10, which is, of course, the natural thing, in base 10, are there infinitely many primes that don't have an 8? Yes, there are. Are there infinitely primes that don't have a 3? Yes, there are. So you might say, why would you do such a silly question? And you can ask about all of mathematics, really. I mean, I know we make excuses for what we do, but I mean, that's a fun, if you don't think that's a fun question, leave. I mean, it's a great question. So, okay, I mean, I could be serious and say that he, he came up with some lovely techniques that are quite applicable. He found beautiful structure, which I'll try and show you some of. It's great stuff, as far as I'm concerned. I purposely kind of wanted to talk about a theorem that was fun more than anything else today. Okay, and you can also ask, does Gauss's heuristic, do you get about A of X over log X uh, primes? OK, so what I want to do is explain to you um, James's approach and some of the nice stuff about it. And OK, so <coughs> I was thinking for the lecture of making this description. You know, there's been two recent-ish recent Fields medals in, in analytic number theory, in this kind of analytic number theory, Terry Tao and James Maynard. And Terry Tao is he's a monster. I mean, you give him a problem, it gets, it gets attacked from all sides till it's devoured. And Maynard's more like sort of a rapier. He, I mean, he's certainly got technical skill, but he finds the right path very beautifully. And I'll go through this, and you'll think, well, that's obvious. And that is what's really annoying about him. You think, oh, I thought about the problem for years. This was obvious. So anyway, let me show you this, this very nice approach. I mean, other people have had results similar, but nobody got to the finishing line, nobody else. So um, yeah, if we want to count the number of primes um, up to n that are in our set A. So A is the set of integers that only have digits from a set D in base B. So I'm, I'm using this characteristic function. 1P is 1, one if it's a prime, 0 if not. 1A is 1 if it's only got digits from D in base B, 0 if not. And we're going to do some Fourier analysis. So this is a discrete Fourier transform, if you like. I'll use the notation E of T as... Uh, uh, e to the 2i pi t, because it's convenient. Um, so this is your Fourier transform. You can put a coefficient outside if you like. It's all fairly irrelevant. Um, and there's a theorem that if you're a mathematician, you call Parseval. If you're a physicist, you call Poincharel, um, which says that you can um, look at the inner product of 1p and, and conjugate of 1a, um, right? f and conjugate of g, and then um, that's equal to the conjugation of the Fourier transforms, um, and the second one being uh, the conjugate. So um, yeah, anyway, this is just a standard formula. And the normalization I've chosen means it's a 1 over an outside. Um, and so OK, so maybe I should just explain what's the idea is, very simply, we're just going to study this formula. We want to see how many primes are in the set. We've got some formula here, albeit a ridiculous formula with lots of analysis in it. So, the question is, can we eke out of this the count that we're looking for? And 
I mean, the first thing is how do you compute these Fourier transforms or get some idea of their size? So um, the first thing we might do is simply take the j equals zero term because that looks easiest. And if you look at the j equals zero term, I mean, go back to the definition, the e to the nt is just zero, right, when you put in t equals zero. So the one hat p of zero just counts one p of n. In other words, the number of primes up to n, so that's pi of n. The second term just counts the number of elements of a set A up to n. We said that pi n over n is like log n, the density of primes. So that gives us a n over log n, which is roughly what we predicted. So when we look at this formula, the j equals zero term appears to already answer the problem. We just have to show that all the other terms are irrelevant. That's a bit tricky, and we'll get onto that in a second. In fact, it's not quite true that we only have a j equals zero term being big, and what I, I should be careful what I say, but the, the, the Fourier transform that corresponds to the primes, that turns out also to be big at a half, at a third, two thirds, a quarter, a fifth, two fifths, any rational or small denominators, and actually anywhere near them because a Fourier transform is a continuous function. So these are called major arcs, where you're near to a rational small denominator, or the major arcs for the Fourier transform for the primes, and that's only big at those points. So we'll talk about when the Fourier transform for small digits is big a little later on. So, oh, I went two slides, sorry. So the bottom of my slide, um, I've put the words in red to mean danger. This is a binary additive problem. So there is another binary additive problem that's very famous. Binary means there's two variables floating around. And the other binary problem that is very famous is Goldbach's problem. Are there, um, for a given integer, even integer n, can we have primes p and q such that p plus q is n? <clears throat> and we can set it up in exactly the same way, the characteristic function for the primes of n times the characteristic function for n minus n. We can take the Fourier transforms, then sort of a miracle occurs by the little identity on the last line, and you get this thing squared. The j equals zero term is nice and large, which is roughly what we'd expect for Goldbach, and actually you've got to take into account the j is a small denominator. But then the question is, can you bound the contribution of the rest of the terms, all the j's that aren't close to a rational with small denominator? And um, the answer, well, I mean, the, the key thing to know is that if you're really gonna show that sum is small, which it is because we believe a Goldbach conjecture, then we might have to know what angles each of these Fourier transforms are at, right, because they're a complex number, but we don't. We have no tools for that. So we can only use absolute values and clever identities. So if I take absolute value of that sum, oh, sorry, I'm just showing there that, um, oh, this is the famous formula for primes at A over Q for uh, a rational small denominator. You can see the pi n over log n and then some other factor. So to prove Goldbach, as I say, we need to work with the contributions for the j of n's that aren't too close to an a over q, with q small, a major arc. And here's, here's the problem is, so I need to bound the sum of uh, the Fourier transform squared. And I can't work with angles, so I might as well just take the absolute value squared. But when I do that, I can use Parseval again and go back to the original problem, and I find out the sum of the squares is pi of n. So if I only use absolute values, I've got no chance of winning, no chance at all of winning. The, error, the sum of the absolute values is bigger than the main terms. So as you know, Goldbach hasn't been proved, and this is why. So um, yeah, so let me, uh, so, so what we want, you notice up above that the main terms are all of size pi n over log n. So what we really need are error terms that are less than pi n over log n. So you may have heard um, that a different problem, the ternary Goldbach problem was solved, and that was solved in 1937. Um, when I say solved, I mean it, it, every sufficiently large odd number is the sum of three primes, um, was proved by Vinogradov back then. What Harold Helfgott claimed in 2013 is that you could start with n equals seven. Um, so he hasn't actually published his proof yet. It's, the technical details are turning out to be rather difficult. Um, but anyway, so Vinogradov's theorem 
um, is very clear. So um, you have these major arcs where your J over Ns are close to a rational small denominator. You have the minor arcs, which is everything else. And what we needed in the binary Goldbach problem is the sum of those things squared. And it turns out what we need in the ternary Goldbach problem is the sum of those things cubed. I won't go into the Fourier analysis that gets you there, but just believe me. So, um, and that's the bound we want, which is an extra pi n in the numerator. So it looks to be a bound of similar strength, but you've got a cube there, and now we just do a very simple trick. We say that um, on the minor arcs, the sum of cubes, you can pull out the large elements in your sum from the minor arcs, and you're left with that sum of squares that comes from Parseval. And so you get enough, a clean upper bound in terms of the maximum. And remember, we needed that less than pi n squared over log n. And so we kind of have a goal. We can, we can define the minor arcs to be any j for which this thing is less than pi n over log n. And that turns out to be actually a fairly simple criteria to work with. And thus, Vinogradov was able to understand exponential sums of primes and prove ternary Goldbach back then. Making this very explicit and getting all the numbers right so you can take it all the way down to seven is a challenge, and hopefully Helfgott will have his details soon. Okay, anyway, um, back to our problem. We need to um, understand this sum, and Vinogradov tells us that um, if we're worried about large um, exponential sums, or large Fourier transforms, one hat p j over n. It's only when j over n is on a major arc, which means it's near to irrational small denominators. And now I want to explore the part that comes from digits. So here's um, a representation of that set. I'm taking n as b to the k, just to make life easy. So I'm looking at all the integers up to my base b to the power k, where k is very large. And then all those integers can be written as d0, d1, da, 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 and base b, where the di's come from my set of allowed digits, like 1, 3, 4 in the original problem. And let's just have, have a look how this looks in the Fourier transform. So um, OK, it's not cleverly coming up over there, is it? <laughs> That's a problem with a laser pointer. You can only do it on one screen. I've got two there, two there. Um, OK, so um, what we get is that when we look at e to the a theta summed over all the elements of our set a up to n, we can now write it in terms of this parameterization of a set, just writing in base b. Now, the great thing about e to the something is it's a multiplicative function. So we can rewrite this thing as just the product of e to the d1, d, e to the d0 times e to the d1b times e to the d2b squared, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, then all those sums separate. The sum over each di separates. We put the di's into different terms. And then you sort of have this miraculous formula that this Fourier transform is a product of what happens at each of the digits. OK, so this is, it's, I mean, it's sort of an elementary argument, but uh, it's nice to see. So now the question is, when is this large? Um, Vinogradov has told us about the prime term. Now we're looking at the digit term. So let me look at the special case where I'm just dropping one digit, delta. Then I can just write out that, that sum as the sum over all possible digits in base b minus the one I'm missing out. And um, well, there's only b minus one digit, so there's a trivial upper bound of b minus one. And I have a different representation there, a representation that I can work with, because here the numerator is no more than two in absolute value, right? e to the i something is no more than one in absolute value, so two in the bottom. Well, that looks like a sine function, essentially. So I can work with the size of a sine function. But I'm just going to ask, when is this large? So in my 1, 3, 4 example, the term would look like e to the 10, 2i pi times 10 to the i theta. The next term is 3 times 10 to the i theta. The next term is 4 times 10 to the i theta. And by large, I mean, when is this pretty close to 3, just, just to give you the idea? Well, I've got to take absolute value here. So it's not that they're each equal to one, but actually they are, because if I look at e to the three times 10 to the i theta and e to the four times 10 to the i theta, they have to be roughly pointing in the same direction in order for the sum of the three terms to have absolute value three. So if those two are roughly the same, then their quotient is one. 
So I have e to the 10 to the i theta is roughly one, okay? That's the only way this thing can be big. That gives me what? When e to the 2i pi u is close to one, that means u is close to zero mod one, right? Yeah, I mean, I've done e to the 2i pi times something. So that means 10 to the i theta is close to zero mod one. Okay, I don't know if you followed all that, but let's just, let's just uh, think, what does it mean if 10 to the, if, if I'm working in base 10, and I tell you I have a number that's very close to zero, okay, and you want to write it out in base 10, by that I mean something over 10 plus something over 10 squared plus something over 10 cubed, either the first digits in decimal are zero, 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 or the first digits in decimal are nine, 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 nine. Right? So that's what we get is if this is true, if this is large, then most of these digits are either zero or b minus one. It's as simple as that. And actually, I think James is the first person to note this, interestingly. Um, anyway, it's a bit more complicated than that because you have to actually make these things small or understand when they're small, but we'll go with this. And the point, well, if we just look at the term in this product, we see that the ith term depends only really on b to the i theta, and that b to the i theta is this expansion in base b. When we're doing e to the something, what I, I just suggested was working with approximations, so we might take an approximation to r digits. So let me fix r. r could be one digit. I mean, if you're looking at e to the something in base 10, e to the 2i pi times 1 over 10, 2 over 10, 3 over 10, blah, blah, blah. It splits the circle into 10 parts. That's a pretty good approximation. You add in the second digit, that's a very good approximation. So once we take r to be some size, these are pretty good approximations to how big this can get. And so working with approximations, we can have um, an upper bound on our uh, exponential sum. And um, that's in terms of the, well, the absolute value of each term. Give me a second to look at that. But uh, let me show you what's the interesting part and the part that, that made this proof very interesting from Maynard is that um, in that product of upper bounds, the b to the i theta term and the b to the i plus one theta term are quite connected because we're only taking an approximation to r digits. The b to the i theta term, the digits are ai plus one, ai plus two to ai plus r. The next thing in there has, has uh, ai plus two, ai plus three, up to ai plus r plus one. They're almost all the same digits except the first and last. So this is some sort of transformation that you can describe by a matrix. You might think of it as a Markov process, a dynamical system, whatever you want to think of it as. But you can start to use tools of those, tech, of his, those subjects to try and analyze what's going on here. That was what's on the last slide. So we'll create a matrix that's a transformation matrix. What's very nice is because we're only changing the first and last digits, although it's a b to the r by b to the r matrix, each row only has b non-zero entries. So let me work in base 10. If I've got a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix here, each row only has 10 non-zero entries in each column. So it's a quite a sparse, very large matrix, and I want to see how it grows. And then, well, you can just use the largest eigenvalue for that. Because I'm letting k get large, the size of a matrix is bounded. So all that matters here is the size of the largest eigenvalue. So somehow Maynard's managed to transform this problem into a largest, largest eigenvalue problem. In r equals one, which is the least interesting case, the i and j coordinates are actually independent, so it's quite easy to get an upper bound on the largest eigenvalue, and so that's fairly simple, and it works for b bigger than 63,000. Um, but he was, you know, he's, Maynard's the kind of guy who says, well, I'm not gonna do this till I get base 10. This would have been a great paper. This would have been sort of Invencione's paper as far as I was concerned, as was, but he decided he's gonna get base 10. So he started taking larger matrices, r equals two, r equals three, r equals four. You get better and better, you can do it for smaller and smaller bases, but he still didn't quite get to where he wanted to get. So what he was able to show was that the number of j's in our sum 
where you don't get a good bound from this method is actually quite small. There's a small exceptional set, which was roughly seven over three to the K out of the 10 to the K values of J. And <coughs> those exceptional values, now in my slide earlier, I said the exceptional values, J is either close to a rational, or has to be both, for the one over P, the one, sorry, the, the prime exponential sum, you have a major arc, so your value of J is near to a rational small denominator, right? And for the digit thing to be large, you need your rational to, in base B, have lots of zeros or lots of B minus ones. So it's kind of a weird thing. You've got to try and understand J over, B to the, J over 10 to the K, where J over 10 to the K is near to a rational small denominator, and simultaneously, there are lots of zeros in B minus one in its base B representation. So this is the question that, that may not have to understand. And um, it took a lot. So I've just got a diagram here. So I've described to you primarily the bottom part, the Markov approximation going to what he called generic minor arcs. The major arcs, the main contributions are easy to handle. The bit I'm not talking about is all that stuff in the middle where he used, you know, each of those is kind of a graduate course of understanding um, to get these exceptional things to work. So it was quite a tour de force to make this work. And finally, he proved the result I'm talking about. OK, that's enough about that. So I'll, I'll, next 15, 20 minutes, I'll talk about good rational approximations to most reals. This is the second half of the diagram in my talk. Um, the top one you might recognize, circumference 22, diameter 7. That's a well-known approximation for pi. You can obviously ask how good is this approximation, whatever good means, are there better approximations? The bottom one is uh, a way to approximate the golden ratio. And uh, um, one plus root five over two. And actually the lengths of the sides of the boxes there give you the approximation of one Fibonacci number divided by uh, the previous one. So. Those are the approximations out of that diagram that you may have, there are some dresses I've seen people wearing with this picture on them. Um, anyway, you can ask about approximations to other reals. So let me just quickly give you uh, a theorem you might know, that Dirichlet's rational approximation to most reals. So if I have a real number that's approximately irrational, um, that means multiplying through by the denominator n, um, n times the number alpha is approximately the integer m, um, and again, I'm going to work mod one. So essentially, n times alpha is close to zero mod one. And then Dirichlet's idea was just look at zero alpha, two alpha up to capital N times alpha, mod one. There's n plus one numbers. So the most spaced out they can be is one over n between each. And that means two of them differ by no more than one over n. If I take little n to be the difference, then n times alpha is less than or equal to one over n. Okay, I'm going fast, but presumably most of you have seen this argument before. Dividing through by that n, I get alpha minus the rational approximation is less than or equal to one over n squared. So that's kind of the, the uh, simple argument that every real number alpha can be approximated by infinitely many rationals that well, like one over n squared. So pi, e, whatever you like, e plus pi, you can find rationals that in terms of a denominator of the rational, this is how good the approximation is. So the question is, can this be much improved? And the answer is no. And um, uh, the golden ratio minus one, I want to put things in the interval from zero to one. So um, root five minus one over two minus the ratio of two consecutive um, Fibonacci numbers, which turn out to be actually the best possible approximation, you get the one over Fibonacci number squared, and there's an extra factor one over root five. And that's an asymptotic. I mean, that is the size of that difference. So you can do better by one over root five, but you can't do better than that. If I said I want an approximation to root five minus one over two by m over n, which is less than one third n squared, you can't do it, or you can only do finitely many. So actually, this is very classical. This is 19th century. And the quality of the approximation depends on the continued fraction and the, entry, the size of the entries. And you can see root 5 minus 1 over 2 as 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Um, so that's why you do so badly. But actually, 
it's quite hard to understand all numbers in terms of the continued fractions, all real numbers. They're different metrics. So that, that sort of approach to understanding how good things are is limited. So let's ask, can we um, approximate most real numbers alpha infinitely often with an error term of one over n cubed? So alpha minus m over n is less than one over n cubed. So if there are at least capital N approximations, one of those approximations has little n greater than or equal to capital N, right? I mean, you could have for little n equals one, two, three up to n minus one, but there's gonna be some approximation to alpha m over n with little n greater than n. So what I'm gonna do is I'm only gonna look at approximations to alpha with m over n with little n greater than or equal to n, and all I'm gonna do is look at the measure of all the intervals that I'm using, the alpha minus m over n less than one over n cubed. So each of those intervals has length two over n cubed, right? Because it's one over n cubed either side of alpha, or either side of m over n. And there's n of them for each little n. So the total measure for each little n is two over n squared. And if I sum two over n squared for all n greater than or equal to n, I get basically two over capital N. And that goes to zero as capital N goes to infinity. So what have I just proved? I've just proved in five lines that the measure of real numbers alpha that have infinitely many rational approximations as good as one over n cubed, that measure is zero. So almost no real numbers have such a good approximation. Actually, we can generalize this argument, and it, it has been. So for some function f psi, um, I'm going to look at alpha minus m over n less than psi over n squared. Now we know psi equals one works for everything, but what about smaller psi? And we want infinitely many approximations. We saw that taking one, you get everything. We saw if c is less than one over root five, you don't get, uh, well, the golden ratio minus one. So that means you don't get everything. You may still get measure one. But there's a wonderful theorem of Kinchin that says if phi of n is a decreasing function, then the measure of, I'm just looking in zero, one, of the set of real numbers that can be well approximated is zero or one, depending on whether that psi, the psi over n is convergent or divergent. divergent. And in fact, the proof I gave you for one over n cubed, proof, the same proof is easily modified for the first case. It's not a hard modification. Okay, so, oh, so I think it's worth mentioning that that proof I gave you is like the proof of the first Borel-Cantelli lemma, so if you know that kind of thing. And um, the second Borel, this is very similar to the Borel-Cantelli lemma, or the second one, the second case, and that would be if your events are independent, so the events of alpha being approximated by a rational with a denominator n. If those were independent and those probabilities diverge because that psi n over n is the probability, um, then almost surely many of EJ occur. You'd have infinitely many. Our big problem here is we can't show these events are independent because approximating something by m over n or r over 2n are clearly not independent events, right? If you have uh, the denominators being clearly arithmetically dependent on each other. And in practice, um, this condition of non-increasing in Kinchin's theorem means you can't do useful, many useful things you'd want to do. So for instance, suppose I wanted to approximate real numbers alpha by rationals where the denominator is a prime. I want to do that because I'm a number theorist. Um, this theorem's not good enough. Okay, so these problems were recognized early on. And in 1941, Duffin and Schaefer showed that um, actually this non-increasing function thing, you can't get away from it because they found a counterexample to if you allowed psi that was a little more complicated. And in their proof, they actually used a lot of fractions like one over third is the same as two over six, same as three over nine. In other words, remember we're approximating by m over n, and I didn't say m and n is a reduced fraction. And what Daphne and Schaefer made a very surprising observation that all the examples they could construct failed when you worked with reduced fractions. You know, you think that's a trivial point, right? But it turns out to be the point that you really want to approximate for reduced fractions. So they made this conjecture of the exactly analogous conjecture. So this phi n over n times pi n, psi n over n is the measure of the intervals with denominator little n. And you make the exact analogous conjecture, but now for reduced fractions, 
And then Kinchin's proof doesn't work. The first case works the same way, actually, the, zero, the measure zero case. The measure one, no version of Kinchin's proof works. So this became the uh, arguably outstanding conjecture in Diophantine approximation, the 1941 conjecture. Um, and you want to do it with no restrictions on psi. Duffin and Schaefer themselves proved a rather suggestive um, result that, um, well, it's the technical condition, but if this holds, then they could prove a conjecture. And what this conjecture really means is that this, we said there's no restriction on psi. So what they showed is if most of the weight of psi lives on integers of only small prime factors or many small prime factors, then this proof doesn't work. But if psi isn't like that, for instance, if psi only works is one on primes and zero everywhere else, then their proof works. So they actually proved it, except in a very strange situation where mostly you're trying to do Diophantin approximations by m over n, where n has lots and lots of small prime factors. So this was proved in 2021 by Dimitris Koukoulopoulos and James Maynard with a blend of many subjects, um, a very beautiful, somewhat complicated proof. Um, I thought um, I would show you some of the, ab the uh, publicity they got. And um, you know, I, I'm English in origin, and I woke up on January the 1st and look at BBC News, and what was the headline was, World Celebrates as UK Brings in New Year. So you think it's only the US that has headlines that thinks everything in the world depends on the US, but no, UK too. Um, anyway, here was one of the uh, publicities for Kukulopoulos and Maynard in a Greek uh, magazine. Maynard is just, is, he's just a shadow on the wall in, in <laughs> this, uh, anyway. Okay, so, um, yeah, so let me just vaguely sketch what goes on. What uh, Pat Gallagher, who's professor of analytic number theory for a long time at Columbia, showed was that actually the measure can only be zero or one in any such problem. So we only need to work with the second case. Um, I should have probably written this earlier. So this is the event that uh, EQ is the event that you're getting approximation with denominator Q. The proof of the second borel cantelli lemma um, could be modified to maybe instead of just trying to prove independence, you could do some sort of quasi-independence, and this would be good enough. So it's kind of technical, but it just sort of says, if they're independent, mu of the intersection of two things would be the product of the mu's. Here we're sort of saying you can lose by a factor of a million on average, and it's still good. So for those of you who are US mathematicians, you probably know the name Andy Pollington. He's been director at um, algebra, number theory, and combinatorics since the beginning of time for NSF. And um, he, uh, yeah, I mean, he, his, he and Bob Vaughan have a major contribution that they gave one way of trying to bound the um, upper bound of this intersection, not a million times, but in terms of some strange function that counts prime divisors of Q and R. And this is what Kukulopoulos and Maynard worked with. And um, it's a long transformation, but the model problem that they worked with is you have a large set of integers between Q and 2Q, and lots of pairs have a big GCD, okay? So you've got, and up to a million, you've got 100,000 integers, and 100,000 squared over 10 of them have a big GCD. There must be some structure. Maybe one integer divides all of those that have the big GCDs. The one integer gives you the GCDs. This isn't true, actually, but a technical variant is, and this is what they proved. And the way they did it was to take their set of integers and create a sort of divisibility graph. So here's all the GCDs, only keeping GCDs if they're reasonably large. So you can see there's uh, the vertices of the integers, the edges of the GCD, they're marked with the GCDs, and the idea is to somehow reduce the size of a graph to try and find that one magic integer. So you kind of remove one prime at a time with some algorithm that allows you to pinpoint what's causing so many big GCDs. In my case, five is the big GCD, I can a bit wimpy. So they use an idea from uh, 
Freeman Dyson and Erdos Kao Rado, which they call iterative compression to pass the smaller and smaller graphs. Um, for me, I mean, I like that argument, but I kind of knew it. But what's very interesting is they have a measure of the graph that's crazy that does the job. So the big trick is kind of a clever, complicated me measure of progress. Um, and yeah, so sorry. I, so that's, I'm not giving more of the proof. I mean, it's not much for proof, but that's what I'm giving you. That's how they proved it. Um, one very nice consequence of the same set of ideas is that suppose that the measure is zero, how big is this? Like that one over n cubed problem. How many, how many alphas are well approximated infinitely often by one over n cubed? And here, because it's a measure zero set, we need to go to Hausdorff dimension. And using some old work of Berzenevich and Villani, um, you can come up with something that gives that. So uh, now I'd like to show a short video. I, I recognize that the proofs I gave were a little, uh, a little uh, sparse. So I wanted um, video. Um, so um, what I want, hold on, it's not the video. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> just, I just want it up. So, and we, I don't think there was volume. Um, so uh, the previous prime minister of Canada, Jean Chrétien, um, was asked by a journalist, uh, how do you know if you've got a proof? And I just want to show you his response. Now the video, please. No, a proof is a proof. What kind of a proof? It's a proof. A proof is a proof. And when you have a good proof, it's because it's proven. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you.